fascinating subject this week. I know it's superfluous to say that. I know they're all fascinating. But we, this week we – you get to watch me talk about something that I know very little about. So that should really be a lot of fun. Uh, just to go over a couple of things, I have extra syllabi here. If you don't – if you're using last year's reader, that's very green of you and I, uh, I approve of this kind of thing. But there will – I'm going to try to keep track of which articles are new. But I think it's a good bet every now and then to look at somebody who has a new reader and see what you don't have and Xerox those articles and uh, just pull them in. So one of the things that I've done is I now have a two-sided copy of the syllabus here for everybody. Now, as far as getting in the course, I think that if you are on the course list and you've been coming here, you don't need to sign up today. So we can dispense with that kind of, you know, grade school activity. Um, if you're on the course list and you haven't been coming, we got to talk. If you're on the wait list, I have the new wait list here. I'm handing that around. <coughs> I'd like to get – check off that you're here today, of course. But also tell me what year you're in and what major you're in. The situation is that at this point it looks like it looks like I can add six people from the wait list and there are 13 on it. So that's the situation is right now. So let me just pass this around. Next slide. Okay. <coughs> okay, I think that's all the announcements that I need to make. So we're going to start talking about uh, science. Uh, and then eventually work our way up to history. And next week we will talk about an Eastern view of science, uh, namely the Vedanta, which was Gandhi's background and it's an interesting uh, seg to the new paradigm that we're trying to construct. Before we do that though, we had something left over from last week. If you remember, we were going to rate Duffy. This is our first example of dog satyagraha. Uh, Duffy had undertaken a spontaneous fast. Now in Satyagraha, we don't like to say that he was fasting against his owners. Gandhi liked to say he offered the fast to his owners. But I'm not sure what rhetoric Duffy was using, but uh, it was a very successful fast. And if you remember the five criteria <coughs> – Let's do that over here. So the first one was that you had to be the right person to do it. Now, of course, you have to put person in quotes uh, here. Seshi, if you want to take a seat right up here, that's fine because you'll be closer. And I don't, I don't know why th – this isn't a yoga class, so I don't know why they push the seats back so far. We, we, when people – when you come in here to start, move the front row up. Will probably involve me in a life and death struggle with a person who's teaching a course in here. But I don't like to have all of this white space between us. Anyway, uh, I propose that we just kind of pass over this one. Duffy was not a person at all. Uh, I hope I'm not getting into trouble with animal rights people. But the fact is he was a very small dog and obviously he did what he did quite spontaneously. Um, that's one thing you know about animal nature is they don't have the same kind of choice that human beings have. But – now I don't remember what order I put these in last time, but the audience, you have to – remember what's the key word here? If, you, if we say against, you have to fast against a lover. Right. And we didn't, we didn't mean that in the modern sense, which has gotten very specific. But <laughs> in the sense that it has to be someone who cares what happens to you or else the gesture has no meaning. Um, what you're saying to a person – remember we're trying to make a, two distinctions here when we talk about fasting within Satyagraha. One, it's not a 
case of suicide. You are not killing yourself. You are risking death. And what you're doing is actually putting your life in the other person's hands. So in a way, it's an act of extreme intimacy. It's an, it's an act of uh, love uh, in the non-modern <laughs> sense of the word. That you're, you're actually putting your life in that person's hands. You're not killing yourself, but you're saying to the person, your behavior is so unacceptable that if you continue it, it's going to kill me. So this is simply an extreme case of taking on the suffering that's in the situation. We're going to get back to that principle at some point. I'm sure it will come up very soon. The other distinction we need to make is uh, this is different from a threat because what you're saying to the person is, I am going to exhibit to you, I'm going to mirror back to you the ultimate consequences of what you're doing. So you're not saying, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to die and then you'll be sorry. It's not quite like that. It's like this is an act of truth. You're killing us. Killing us. You're killing our people and I'm going to show you that you're doing it to wake up your conscience. And once you realize what you're doing, you'll make your choice whether to continue <coughs> doing it or not. So that's why you have to be carrying on this conversation and inc incidentally, Nonviolent <coughs> actions can be thought of as a conversation on a nonverbal level with someone who's not listening to you verbally anymore. So in the conversation, you have to obviously keep that person in the loop and uh, you're not coercing them. You're getting them to listen to a different kind of rhetoric. Okay? So I think uh, we can check this off. Duffy <coughs> obviously fasted against a lover in the sense that it was his owners and they didn't want the poor critter to die. And that's what constituted the awakening or the uh, persuasion of them. Okay? Then I'm going to get, get you more involved in the rest of the answers. So a third criterion I suppose was the request has to be doable. I'm thinking of a case in the early 80s when there were two people who were upset about the Cold War and the arms race and they decided to fast against uh, Premier Khrushchev and President uh, Eisenhower to make them stop having the arms race. And that was kind of ridiculous. They were – there's just two people that these presidents had never heard of. So it was the wrong audience. They were the wrong people. They, it was not doable. They could not say to their respective constituencies, which were you know, several hundred million people, oh, there's two guys in America who don't want us to do this, so we're going to stop. So that's an example of violating all – just basically all the basic rules of fasting. Needless to say, these two guys lost a lot of weight and then they stopped and the, the arms race went rolling on. Okay. So was the act doable? Yes, of course. In fact, they did it. And fourth, was it consistent with the entire campaign or the entire relationship between Duffy and his owners? What would be our criteria here? I'm thinking to put this in relief. Let's take a look at the case that we mentioned briefly, those uh, hunger strikers or fasters in Long Kesh prison uh, during one of the severe Irish troubles. Um, these are people who were members of the R IRA who had used violence uh, repeatedly. Again, this is not to condemn them. It's just the fact that they had used violence. And then because they were in prison, they had nothing else to do, had no other recourse. They decided to go on hunger strike and it was a complete failure in the sense that they died rather than get any kind of an opening on the part of uh, Margaret Thatcher and the rest of the regime. And I was saying that this fails on the grounds of consistency because if you'd let them out of prison, they would have immediately picked up guns or power drills or whatever they use uh, for weapons and gone back to using violence. So you cannot use 
nonviolence as a tactic in the context of a violent struggle. If you try to do that, it's what's called nonviolence of the weak. You're using violence because you don't have it at that moment. And that's part of what we were calling strategic nonviolence before, but not part of principled nonviolence. So uh, I don't know if this is going to be terrifically illuminating, but yeah, I mean, Duffy was a sweet dog. He never, he did not go around viciously biting these people and then uh, decided to go on a hunger strike on this particular occasion. This was very consistent with his entire relationship with them. And finally, last resort. This means that because of the ultimate nature of the sacrifice and because you are drawing the other person into a very serious uh, – what shall I say? You're putting them up against a very serious decision that they have to make. You do not do this off the crack of the bat. This ha you have to have tried everything else first. And again, most of the fasts that we were talking about um, that we see, that is, around us, people go into it much too early. Uh, on one occasion, Gandhi was attacked by some black flag people. You know, these were these are actually the people who are running India right now. But this was the uh, nationalist movement, people who thought he wasn't being – uh, political enough or angry enough or something. And they attacked me, literally attacked him. He was stepping down off a train and they came after him with these staves. And he looked at them and laughed and he said, what are you going to accomplish by breaking this head? You know, it doesn't even have any hair on it to protect itself. There's many ways in which I've been imitating Gandhi. <laughs> this is one of them. Uh, and they, so they were startled. They didn't know what to do. And this is a very common opening – Gambit in a nonviolent emergency situation, you get people flummoxed. They come after you expecting you to be frightened, uh, submissive, and you simply stand up to them and you aren't. And they're, they're flummoxed. They don't know what to do. So they had an opening and, and they said, okay, well, what do you expect we should do? And he said, well, first you should submit a petition to me telling me what your grievance is. And they said, no, no, no we're not into that and you wouldn't listen anyway. And you know, we can't spell. This won't work. So he, he, he went on, stepped them through about six or eight things that they should do against him. And finally he said, then if all of that fails, you should undertake a fast unto death against me. And <laughs> they, they looked at one another and said, no, we're not uh, ready for this. And then he said, well, then I can't help you. <laughs> it was a funny kind of conversation. But Gandhi always had funny conversations with his opponents. We'll see a number of – Examples of that. But uh, how about – I mean, let's take this quasi-seriously now. Here's, here's Duffy. You know, he wants his owners to give him back to the children. Uh, what else could he have done? I mean, I imagine that he had, he had tried to communicate with them in every way possible. The problem being that they didn't speak modern terrier or whatever <laughs> it was that Duffy was trying to communicate in. He had no other way of communicating with them except through that extreme act. So this is a case where I would say it was appropriate for Duffy to do that. Um, but it would not be appropriate for a person who had not tried in every way possible first to communicate with the person then when they refuse to listen to you, you move into various forms of civil disobedience or in, in other ways you take on the suffering and the situation. And finally, when all that has failed, if all that has failed, then you move into something drastic like refusal to eat. Okay? So I, I give you this whole model partly – well, partly as a joke really, but partly also seriously to show – that there are patterns very deep in the in evolution of behavior which move in the direction of nonviolence rather than in the direction of nature red in tooth and claw, which was the old motto about what people thought that nature was um, up until recently. Okay?
So I hope that you found that terrifically amusing and uh, <laughs> extremely illuminating. So let's get back to the world of people and start talking about the scientific paradigm <laughs> that we're in. And before we actually get into it, I, I'd like to share a reflection with you, uh, be a little bit philosophical here. Uh, something that occurred to me over the weekend that it seems that we human beings are unwilling or unable to believe things that are – thanks. You want to take a chair? Yeah. To believe – has everyone now who's on the wait list signed in? Okay. We seem to have trouble grappling with things that are uh, like extremely horrible. They're off the deep end in terms of how horrible they are. And we seem to have the same difficulty grokking things that are extremely wonderful. It's, it's a curious observation that I made. I just made it on Saturday. So it's not like this has stood the test of time. But I put this out this for us to contemplate. Uh, then let me give you one example of something that's going on right now that's pretty horrible, all right, and in a, f in a weird way nobody is paying attention to it. Fortunately, we don't have to deal with the horrible stuff. The rest of what we're going to be talking about is stuff that's too wonderful to believe. Uh, but I thought we ought to balance the picture. At Sonoma State University, there is a project called Project Censored. And what they do is they pick up stories that did not get into the mainstream media. And every year they publish a little book which is the, with the 25 most important censored stories of that year. So for this year, story number 18 is a story about Professor Steve Jones at Brigham Young University who is a physicist. And he has put together a group of uh, 50 top-ranking scientific experts from various appropriate disciplines, including someone who was on President Bush's uh, – not in his cabinet, but on, <coughs> in his administration during the first uh, four years. And these people are telling us in the plainest possible language that it is against the laws of physics that the Twin Towers collapsed in the way that the official story says that they collapsed. The official story is they were hit by airplanes uh, in an hour. The metal uh, structure melted, though steel doesn't melt at that temperature, and then it pancaked down. You know, the top section hit on the lower floors and pancaked on down. But unfortunately for this theory, that process actually has been filmed and that's not what happened. What happened was there was a series of explosions and the steel frame of the building collapsed first and it went into basically free fall. And then the third tower, WT7, collapsed in 6.6 .6 seconds. It would have taken six seconds in free fall. And it would have taken, I don't know, 25 seconds, a minute or something if it happened in the way that they predicted. So we're shocked, right? What the hell are we supposed to do with this? Here's this huge public story and it violates the laws of physics. It could not possibly have happened the way they say that it happened. And yet we had FEMA and we had something else and we had an official commission. People came in, I'm sure they were wearing <coughs> business suits and they were very rational and they paid their taxes and they sat around a table and they consciously or unconsciously ignored all the facts that didn't fit into their story. Okay? So I felt I wanted to share that with you as an illustration of how when things get so bad that we can barely cope with them, we don't want them to be true, somehow we back away from them. And now as I say, fortunately, it's not our business in this course to go there, explore what happened. We're not investigative journalists. We're trying to look at the new paradigm in which this kind of thing won't happen anymore. And in fact, I might just say by way of introduction <coughs> that this is my way of going about solving the problem. 
is creating a paradigm in which the problems that need to get solved can get solved in a constructive way and not in a way that leads to deeper – leads us deeper and deeper into the problem. So the rest of what I'm going to be talking about are examples of things that are really mind-boggling in the opposite direction and yet they do not make it into the, into the official story, which is extremely frustrating and that's something I think that we have to solve. And I'd like to introduce this by sharing with you a statement that Gandhi made in 1933. Now the background for this is – again, we're tying into the FAST technique. In 1932, in September, the uh, Viceroy, the head of the paramount power in India, the British uh, Raj, decided – and in case, this is one of these cases of really mad decisions made by people in power. We're going to look at several of them. He decided that there should be separate electorates in India for the untouchables, uh, that is the, the non-caste Hindus and the caste Hindus. And uh, I, we don't know what motivated him. He was not basically one of the worst of the viceroys. He was a pretty good person. He was in communication with Gandhi most of the time. But what he must have been thinking with this whacked out idea, I don't know. Uh, Gandhi was not in a position to do a whole lot about it. In fact, he was in prison. He'd been in prison since he came back from the roundtable conference uh, the year before. And uh, to him, this meant the vivisection of India. If you, made, if, if you made it a statutory reality – that's his language – that untouchables are different kinds of animals from caste Hindus. This would deepen the rift between them and he'd been working his whole career and was going to go on focusing for the rest of his whole career on reintegrating these people into Indian society. It's one of his relative success stories uh, that this would kill him, so to speak. And so he took the decision to fast unto death. This was an open-ended, unlimited fast. And he tried to make it clear that it was not directed against the Viceroy, though he was the cause of the problem, but it was directed at his fellow Indians to rouse them so that they would come up with some kind of compromise and do something about this. And this, this is sometimes called the Epic Fast. It's his second most famous fast. It's a strange way to <laughs> person to look back at his career. You know, my most famous fast, but <laughs> his most famous one was in 47 against the communal rioting uh, in Bengal. And there's a little book by his secretary, Pyarela, called The Epic Fast. They'll give you the whole detail. But we're going to get to that uh, when we get to it. I just wanted to focus on how he made this decision and, and what he said about it. Because a lot of people argued with him and said, this is a bad decision. And he said, sorry folks, you're out of luck because it wasn't a decision. I'm just following orders. God told me to do it. And, and they said, what do you mean God told you? He said, well, I heard a voice. I was in despair. In the middle of the night I heard a voice and it said, thou must go on a fast. I really I like this story because it, it shows something that I've believed for a long time now that uh, obviously God was a Quaker. <laughs> <laughs> thou must go on a fast. And Gandhi said, how long? And the voice said, uh, open-ended. And he said, okay, when do I start? And the voice said, oh, let's make it tomorrow at 10. <laughs> and he said, okay, and off he went. And see, his best friends could not argue him out of this because this did not come from people. This came from God. So obviously – and incidentally, the fast was a huge success. He got his people rallied and they hammered out a compromise. I think this was from September 20th until – 26th or something like that. It was, it did, you know, he was snatched back from the jaws of death. It's very dramatic and we maybe get a chance to talk about it a little bit more when we get to that point. But the point here is that he then gets into a long discussion with various people who think that he's nuts. And there were – there still are a lot of people in that category. You know, perhaps – I don't know. Anyway, let's not finish that sentence. But th uh, they – accused him 
of having a hallucination. He said, you know, there's no way to tell the difference between the voice of God and hallucination. He said, yeah, there's a way. Uh, if it's the voice of God, it's going to lead to life. And if it's a hallucination, it could easily lead to death. And he said, you see what happened here. It led to my risking my life, sacrificing my life, but not losing my life and nobody else losing theirs either. And they kept after him, you know, this is a hallucination. And finally, he made this amazing statement. He said, the claim that I have made, namely that this was the voice of God, the claim that I have made was neither extraordinary nor exclusive. In other words, it's not just me. He said, God will rule the lives of all those who will surrender themselves to him without reservation, period. And he said, there is no question of hallucination. I have stated a simple scientific law which can be tested by anyone who will have the will and the patience to carry out the necessary preparations, which are, again, incredibly simple to understand and easy enough to practice where there is determination. Now, uh, I'm making two points with this story. Uh, First, that this is an example of something that we find it difficult to believe because it's too good to be true as opposed to difficult to believe because it's too bad to be true. And secondly, that obviously he had a different conception of science and what science is and who uses it and what you do with it than we have. And he actually was typically Hindu in this regard. And I think we're going to see that we have inflicted on ourselves two huge prejudices about what science is. The first is that science deals with the outside world, period, with the objective world. Do you remember back in the beginning of the semester I told you because nobody else – I have nobody else to complain to, so I inflict all of my woes and sorrows on you people. Uh, you've been very patient and I do appreciate it. I remember my kind of whining up here that I wanted the meditation class to be called Pax 164L. And I said, it's not real science. Real science, it would be a wet lab. You have to show us the chemicals. You know? And since I couldn't you know, put it in a bottle and paint it green, it wasn't real science. So it wasn't a real laboratory. Okay, well, you know, I have a lot of battles to fight some of them here at this university. So that was not one that I – I decided not to undertake a fast unto death against the Committee on Courses of Instruction on that particular point. But it does show up the fact that for us, for something to be scientific, it has to deal with the outside world, with the objective world. And the person who's been very helpful on helping us see the limitation of this recently is the Dalai Lama. He's been, he has been working a lot with scientists. Uh, he even went down to Stanford and had a day-long conference there, which I thought was very generous of him. And he is constantly saying, you guys are terrific at the objective side of reality. I mean, my hat is off to you. If I were wearing a hat, <laughs> I would take it off to you for what you guys have discovered. I mean, it's really incredible and nobody is knocking this. You, know, you can have laser surgery for your cataracts and go home that same afternoon. It's wonderful. But it's only half the story and you know a bird cannot fly with one wing. You also need to do science on the subjective side of reality. Well, how do we do that? Well, that of course is where the problem comes in. And that's where Gandhi says you need will, patience and determination. And what we say is we'll do it if we can get a grant. But we won't do it if it needs will, patience and determination. That we're, we're not going to change. So that's one big, uh, uh, as I say, kind of a prejudice or a limitation that we've imposed on ourselves. And the other, which we're now getting over, is this notion that the more negative something is, the more likely it is to be true. It's very strange. I'm going to be illustrating this repeatedly as we go up the, the line. But science has been successful 
using the technique of reductionism in two different senses. One, that you break things down into smaller and smaller parts, try and understand what makes those parts tick, or if they're too small to tick, what it, noise do they make when they bang into each other, and then build up back the big picture from that. But it's also reductionist in the sense that the more – the less we can discover meaning in nature, the more we think we're being scientific. And then just to give you one quick illustration here, I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I was going to build this up slowly from physics to biology to behaviors, behavioral sciences. But I remember seeing a documentary once about uh, chimpanzees. I don't know why I was watching. There was, it was before Jane Goodall, so that was not the reason. Maybe we used to have a president who had a close relationship with a chimpanzee. Maybe that's what uh, had put me in this frame of mind. But anyway, these scientists were following these chimpanzees and uh, recording their behavior and narrating what they're seeing. So at one point – now as it turns out, chimps are pretty aggressive uh, critters. And that's in fact one of the problems in primate behavior is that they studied chimpanzees almost exclusively and they came up with a skewed model of how nasty it is to be a monkey or an ape. Uh, anyway, here are these chimps and sure enough, there's a big blow up and they're running around banging on one another, <coughs> say, oh yeah, your mother is a orangutan and things <laughs> like that. Or whatever chimps do to insult each other. Uh, and, uh, and the narrator said, the animals are angry. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yes, this is very, very smart. Uh, and then this went on for a while and they decided, if that's the word that I want, they decided to make up. So they were doing all the things that chimpanzees do when they want to stop fighting. Not exactly the kinds of things that you and I would do, you know. Got any lice, <laughs> you know. Uh, can I scratch your back and things like that. And then the narrator came on and said, the animals are exhibiting signs of affectionate behavior. You get the subtle difference there? When it looks like they're angry, they're angry. But when it looks like they're loving, they couldn't possibly be loving. There's no such thing as chimpanzee love. There's only chimpanzee anger. They are exhibiting signs of affectionate behavior as though they actually had affections, but you know they couldn't. So this is only one of thousands of examples that I began to notice myself when I got interested in this field. And we're going to talk about that bias a little more systematically in a bit. Okay, so in what follows, I'm going to accept the model that you have in your reader from the book uh, The New Biology by Stanchu and O'Gross who say, and I'm not going to contest it for the time being, that the basic building block of our knowledge validating system is physics. Phys physics is the fundamental science. We start from there. We go on to chemistry, especially if we're med students. And then we get up to the life sciences like biology which are getting softer, right, and less, less secure. We can't uh, – actually, one of the problems with the life sciences from the point of view of developing a formal hard science based on mathematics is that the essence of life – I'm going to tell you something and I'm going to back up a little bit and tell you why I'm telling you it. The essence of life is diversity. Now, the, the, here's the background for this little statement. Uh, when we were starting Peace and Conflict Studies, we had a, a guest lecturer. I brought in a friend of mine who was from the engineering school, but uh, – I shouldn't say but. Engineering school and a deep thinker. And, and, uh, <laughs> And he was interested in peace and wanted to talk to students. So I, I brought him to give us a talk. So he came into what, what was later to become PAX 10, <coughs> our introductory course. We weren't even on campus at that point, by the way. We were meeting across Bancroft Hall. I mean, talk about marginalized. <laughs> but anyway, you've given me enough sympathy today. So let's get back to my story. He started by putting a lot of equations on the board and the students and I 
were panic-stricken. I mean, we were in absolute despair. We're supposed to remember this stuff. But fortunately, he was getting somewhere with these equations. He was getting from the equations to the regularities in nature from which we can derive laws. And then he asked himself and us the question, why is it that physics and biology, which started at about the same time, are now in such utterly different places in regard to the fact that physics is one of the most brilliant theoretical structures <coughs> of any human enterprise. I mean, he took, he, even Einstein has been surpassed now in some ways. It's incredibly brilliant what people have come up with in the world of theoretical physics. I understand there's a particular coffee shop on the north side where they're working out string theory between the hours of 8 and 10 in the morning. <laughs> You can go down and hear for yourself how incredibly brilliant these guys are. Now, biology started at the same time. And yeah, they've discovered a lot of facts. They have a lot of Latin names for different insects. and <laughs> They can tell you how they breed and stuff like that. But as for a theory of what makes life work, it, by comparison, it's juvenile. I mean, Darwin was a tremendous genius in terms of biological theory, and he was wrong. Or at least partly, partly. I'm not saying there isn't evolution, by the way. I, I'm not from that part of the country. <laughs> when I say that. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, so <laughs> we knew about evolution out there. Uh, we, don't, we didn't know about it. wasn't any nature, but we knew about evolution. Anyway, uh, so then my friend got to the climax of his presentation. We were by now, phew, we didn't have to memorize the theories. I mean the equations, and we were sitting on the edge of our seat. What is the explanation for this? Why is biology so behind with regard to physics? So because physics operates on the assumption or looks at nature from the framework of uniformity. Uh, suppose you have something that you want to study and you call it an electron. It turns out that they don't exist. But that's okay. You can study them for a long time before you find that out. An electron that's what? That's here on this desk, and there's probably quite a few of them, even though they don't exist. I will explain all of this. An electron here on the desk is going to be identical to an electron in that poor hunk of rock out there called Pluto. We, have, we should give a little support to Pluto because it's just been terribly downgraded and prejudiced <laughs> against. So you took this electron, you was very far away. I, you know me in numbers. I don't know how far away. It's really far away. And uh, the only thing that they would – the only thing different between these two electrons would be their velocity and their position, both of which are relative anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but they have exactly the same mass to the extent that an electron has mass. And they have exactly the same charge. And we know from beginning physics classes, they're tiny, <coughs> tiny little yellow balls, right? <laughs> and they both say – with a negative minus sign on them. <laughs> we know all this. But they're absolutely identical. And the model that physicists use to describe the universe is one in of unity in uniformity. They're looking for laws that will apply to electrons anywhere. And all electrons are the same. And somehow our brains are so constructed that we find it easy to work with that kind of model, uniformity model. However, if you would try to apply the uniformity model to living systems, you go straight into fascism. <laughs> it does not work. The essence of living systems is their diversity. You know, it's not that there aren't patterns. It's not that there aren't laws of a kind that you can derive. But if you miss the diversity, you miss everything about the life sciences. So the life sciences are, quote, softer. And what we believe to be true about them has to rest upon the beliefs of physics and then build up from there to the even softer sciences like uh, psychology and then onto the softest and most dismal sciences of all, which are like political science and <laughs> things like that. And where we're going to put peace studies in all of this, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm, maybe we're just off the chart. You know, we're sort of Gandhi and we're tying the two ends back together. So let's accept those, th those levels that we have, the physical sciences, the, the life sciences and the social sciences. In that kind of a hierarchy, let's accept that for now. 
And I'm going to be posing three questions that we'll get around to answering probably late Thursday or next week on Tuesday. And those three questions are, what is the nature of matter? Not what is the matter with nature. What is the nature of matter? What is matter? And the second question is sort of a scarecrow. You're going to see obviously what the answer to it is. You'll probably know already. That question is, is competition the dominant force in evolution? Because up until recently this was believed implicitly. And thirdly and finally, what does the historical record say? about the presence and the viability of nonviolence. Okay? Yeah. So the three questions are what what is what is stuff? What is matter? You know, what what's really what is it? <laughs> really? And secondly, what I what is the role of competition in evolution? And thirdly, what does history say about nonviolence? Maybe I am uh, you know, spending more time on that third question than necessary, but I'm coming from a slightly traumatized background here where I would talk my heart out about nonviolence and then I'd run into some student who had dropped the course and I, said, I, I, I would say, I notice you're not in the course anymore and the student would say, oh yeah, I thought all that stuff you're talking about is really nice, but you know, I read history. <laughs> And so this is, this is what I'm trying to overcome. Maybe it's not necessary for you, but it will possibly be necessary for your roommates, significant others, your parents, and so forth. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit. This is the part that I really love most and understand least, that what scientists are really saying about matter, uh, you know, the stuff that has mass and energy. I expect there's probably several of you who know this story better than me. So if you wish to raise your hand and politely <laughs> tell me that I'm talking through my hat, you just go ahead and do that. But uh, I'm interested in this stuff and I like it and I read about it, but obviously uh, I am innocent of mathematics. Third semester of calculus was taught by a Hungarian refugee who could barely speak English. And I was so terrorized by the middle of the semester that I stopped. And uh, that's the story of me and mathematics. Uh, s however, uh, the story uh, begins at the beginning of the 20th century and it's kind of fascinating. Someday somebody's going to have to study this. Maybe I'll study it because it looks like you could probably get a Nobel Prize for this. And I, I could use the money. Something happened between 1898 and 1912. Everything, the whole world turned upside down. This is the very period when Gandhi invents or presents to the public Satyagraha and on what, on what date? Let's get some exact numbers here. Right, September 11th, 1906. Question? Oh, he kept very careful records through that whole period. And he wrote uh, two books in 1923. One was called My Experiments with Truth, which is his autobiography, and the other was Satyagraha in South Africa. So this is the interesting thing about Gandhi. Here he is. He's so out of the box that nobody's caught up with him yet. And it's like a hundred years later. But at the same time, he was a banya. He was he was the equivalent, the Gujarati equivalent of an MBA in accounting. <laughs> that was his background. So he kept very careful financial records. Every penny had to be accounted for. And the, a great advantage that he had was he didn't sleep. Now think of how much time we lose <laughs> every night sleeping hours and hours. You know, he only slept about two and a half hours a night, two and a half, three hours at least by the time he got back to India. So what are you going to do? You can't sleep. Everybody else is asleep. You can't text message the Viceroy because they haven't invented it yet. <laughs> so you write your memoirs. So every day an, an incredible correspondence. And the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi uh, are 98 volumes. And it's been calculated, friends of mine in India have told me that this is two-thirds of the output. That you know, somewhere in some little ashram, moldering away in somebody's box, there's letters and uh, 
newspaper accounts and all this stuff. So he was quite meticulous about that. Okay. So where was I? Be in this 14-year period, he's making these incredible discoveries on the very, very soft end of the scale, human behavior, and scientists are making these incredible discoveries on the hardest end of the scale. And as I understand it, it started like this. First of all, Einstein showed that uh, matter had to come in atoms. He, uh, his, his laboratory was his study, the way I imagined it happening. He's, he's playing his violin and he, there's a beam of sunlight coming through the window and these dust particles are dancing around. And he's saying, ach Gott, he says to himself <laughs> in the middle of this Brahms rhapsody. Uh, he says, God, those dust particles, sehr, sehr klein, you know, they're so small. What is making them bounce around? And he did some calculations in his head with the force necessary to make a dust particle go pop, 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 pop instead of zip. And he came out that air has to consist of atoms. And it just, people had been saying this since the ancient Greeks, but he gave it mathematical formalism and therefore you have to believe it. That's the way it works. You don't have to accept the prizes, but you have to believe what mathematics tells you. And I'm not quarreling with that. I don't know what mathematics <laughs> tells you, but <coughs> people tell me what it says. So I'm willing to believe it. So, okay, this is a great breakthrough because here are people trying to understand what, what makes – I mean, for example, I mean the Greeks had worried about this problem. You have a horse. The horse eats grass. How does the grass turn into a horse? You have to break it down into very, very small parts. Therefore – and these parts were smaller than you could see. Therefore, life has to be atomic on the material level. And it's amazing that within ten years ha of having discovered that matter has to be atomic, they discovered that it can't be, that there aren't – that atoms don't exist. And the way it happened was this, as I understand it. There was a problem. Uh, the problem was if you heat up a piece of metal, it doesn't turn yellow right away. It goes to blue and red and yellow, something like that. Each of these colors has a specific energy to it. You know how much energy you're putting in with the flame and you, can be, you should be able to predict which light waves are coming out and the predictions aren't working. According to what they were understanding, it should be yellow right away. What's this blue? So a man named Max Planck who was a fairly good pianist and who had gone to his uh, physics – preceptor at one point and said, I'm toying between – I have to make a career choice here. Does this sound familiar? Should I go into piano or physics? And his professor said, you know, physics is a sucked orange. We've discovered everything about physics. I think you should do piano, Max. Well, Max, although he was German, was uh, not one to always obey what his teachers told him. Very dangerous move. Always obey whatever your teachers tell you. <laughs> and he said, no, you know, maybe there is something to this physics after all. And he was a little intrigued by why the blue, yellow, red thing. So he said, you know, the only way to solve this is to put in a factor in the equations that isn't real, but it would cancel itself out. And he came up with something absolutely brilliant. You can, you can see how, how brilliant it is. <laughs> this stands for Planck's constant. And the implication of it is that energy changes are discontinuous. That the, it goes in jumps, which in the implication of that is that everything is discontinuous. The time is discontinuous. Now Planck had no way of knowing that this was a major Buddhist theory the theory of Chanakavada or dependent origination. He didn't know that at that time. Uh, and so he figured that when he did the math, the little H's would cancel out and you'd have your answer. Well, he did the math. They had to do it all by himself. The computers were down. <laughs> no, they weren't up yet. That's right. <laughs> uh, and darn it, the little constant wouldn't cancel out. So he went back and he did it again, did it again very thoroughly. The darn thing would not cancel out. He had to come to the conclusion reluctantly that it was real. It wasn't just 
uh, mathematical convenience and that, that meant that nature actually was discontinuous. And it came in what they decided to call quantums, which is a Latin word for amount, an amount. And for quanta is the plural. And that led to a fantastically different way of looking at the material world. And let me just put into contrast here Sorry, I thought I had these quotes in your reader and I s they still may be there, but I wasn't able to find them, so I you may not either. Let's go back to the beginning of the 18th century and uh, Sir Isaac Newton, who was you know, the greatest genius in physics up to his time, 1704, he wrote a book called Optics. And it is kind of interesting how many of these basic, basic discoveries had to do with the nature of light? So you come up to David Bohm, for example, who passed away recently. And one of his most brilliant formula formulations was, the universe consists of frozen light. Basically, everything is light acting as if it were matter, energy, and so forth. Anyway, and also Goethe, the German poet, thought that his greatest contribution to life was not Faust or any of these poems that uh, people memorize and recite and enjoy and are so proud of, but his contribution to the theory of color, Farbenlehre. That's what he wanted to be known by. Anyway, Newton in his optics said, God in the beginning formed matter in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, movable particles. Of such sizes and figures and with such other properties and in such proportion to space as most conduced to the end, capital E, for which he formed them. And that these primitive particles, being solids, are incomparably harder than any porous bodies composed of them. Even so very hard – and you have to love 18th century English. Even so very hard as never to wear or break in pieces. No ordinary power being able to divide what God himself made one in the first creation. Now this is the physics of <coughs> 1704, but this is the physics that I learned in school a few years ago. And I think you're probably still learning versions of this. In fact, I learned it three times. I learned it in public school and then I learned it in high school and then I learned it in college and then I never heard the word quantum mentioned once. That was like 50 years after the discovery of quantum theory and 30 years after its uh, ultimate triumphant conclusion in what's called the Copenhagen interpretation in the middle of the 1930s and nobody told me a word about it. Fortunately, because wouldn't you rather have me be a successful nonviolence professor than a failed physicist, mm -hmm. which I surely would have been in this case. But anyway, this was the basic paradigm of science, that matter comes in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, yada da yada da, never broken apart little particles. And when I went to school, I was told that, you know, there were large black ones with a plus on them and very, very small yellow ones with a minus on them and then the little brown ones with an N on them and, and these things coming apart and recombining made the experiences of chemistry and life. And the reason you decided to come to Berkeley was programmed in these little solid balls. But what Planck was discovering was shaking this whole thing to bits. And for example, it is now known that if an electron shifts to a different shell in an atom, it doesn't say bye-bye, you know, I'm leaving shell A, I'm going to shell B. And it doesn't travel from shell A to shell B. It disappears from shell A and instantaneously reappears in shell B. There's that kind of discontinuity. And now to read you some quotes from Henry Stapp who actually works up the hill here in theoretical physics. According to the orthodox quantum theory of nature, the actual things from which the universe is built are not persisting entities as in classical physics, not these little hard, massy, impenetrable particles, 
but are rather events. The world consists of events called quantum jumps. Now, at this point, you're like me, likely to be thinking, what the hell are you talking about? How do things consist of events? And I'm sorry, but I can't explain that. And at least I have the satisfaction of knowing that nobody <laughs> else can either. <laughs> and this is part of the problem with quantum theory. That's why I wasn't taught quantum theory in school, is that you cannot build a simple model to explain how we get a solid world out of what is in effect a shifting foam of probabilities. But scientists believe that this is the case. I don't know if any of you saw uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? Any of you see that? How many of you saw that? I'm just kind of curious. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of, it was kind of a cult classic. <laughs> and, I, and I think that as far as the science goes, I don't think it was wrong. I, I may find out differently because a week from Wednesday, I'm going to be attending a day-long conference called The Science of Peace. So I may have to come back and contradict everything that I'm telling you today. But uh, I think the uses made of that truth were ridiculous in that movie, but the scientific part of it is true. I mean, the reason that we're sitting here on the second floor of Wheeler and are not plummeting toward the molten magma at the center of the Earth because of gravity in the classical model is <coughs> that we're solid and the chair, chairs are solid or the floor and these two solid objects come up against one another and they can't go any further. But no scientist believes that. Rather, the case is, first of all, the problem is that the amount of matter in what we call an object, even if you believe in the nucleus of the atom being material, is so small that if every human being on the planet could get condensed so that all the matter were squished together and there's no space in between, the entire human race could be fitted inside a peanut shell. That's how spread out this stuff is even as matter. It would still weigh the same. You know, the burden on the earth <laughs> would be exactly the same, but it would be concentrated in one peanut shell. So what's really happening when I don't fall through the floor and you're sitting on your chairs and when we why we're going to be very careful to open the door <coughs> when we leave this classroom is that the force fields of the electrons in the molecules that compose our body repel each other. And that's what's happening. It's not a concussion of solid objects against one another. So even when you run your car into a telephone pole, <laughs> it's a lot of electrical charges repelling each other and not solid matter. But worse than that, um, the ultimate conclusion of quantum theory, which up to now has been the most securely established theory in science. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how some people tried to defeat it and they failed. The ultimate conclusion is that there basically is no objective material world. All there is is experiences. And Max Planck himself said, everything is consciousness. Without consciousness, nothing can be said to exist. If you clip the statement out and said, who said that? You would say the Buddha or some flipped out person like that. But actually, it was a physicist. So this led to some distressing conclusions. I mean, it's distressing enough if you think that the world isn't real. I think that's kind of that's a bit alarming. <coughs> um, but it also leads to the conclusion that we cannot have definite certain knowledge about anything because we thought that if you knew where all the atoms were and what forces were acting at them, you could predict from moment A where things would be in moment A plus one. But you can't do that because there's probability waves that come in in between. And scientists are hard put to describing how come we have like 80 different people sitting in 80 different chairs listening to a brilliant, fascinating lecture on quantum theory when all it really is is these probability waves fuzzing out all over the place. <coughs> and they have they, – they really can't quite explain it, but they, one of the theories uh, is called the collapse of the wave function. And that says that when you decide to make an observation 
its probabilities on a gross level coalesce into an observable world. Now, why am I telling you all this? I'm, I'm getting to that. <laughs> um, about these jumps – this is Henry Stapp again – about these jumps or sudden changes in the Heisenberg state of the universe, the first basic property is that these jumps are not controlled by the mathematical laws analogous to the classical laws of motion. The second basic property is their non-local character. Let me talk about that one. Okay. Once you figured out <coughs> the, re the realities and the rules of quantum theory, one of the distressing but in a way kind of intriguing conclusions that they came to was that any two entities that are ever in connection of any kind would remain connected. And in other words, uh, if, if two atoms were part of the same molecule, their probability waves are linked forever. Now this led to a really startling conclusion, which begins to sound more like mysticism than science, that the universe is non-local. That means that anything that happens happens everywhere. This again is pretty mind-boggling. I mean, I think, okay, here, look, I'm going to drop these glasses on the desk. It makes a very small noise. If I were uh, Armstrong up there on the moon with my space helmet on, listening to whatever those guys listen to in their space capsules, whatever it be, rap, bluegrass, whatever they like, he would not hear that. The sound would not get there. But according to quantum theory, everything that happens is a shift of the entire universe simultaneously. Everything is totally interconnected. The quantum jump, these events that make up reality, is intrinsically a shift of the entire universe. Uh, Einstein hated this. Uh, you can sort of see why. He said there was only room in one given century for one bad joke. And relativity was pretty sick already. And now you're telling me that I can't make observations about nature and that you have what he called these spooky effects at a distance. So, you know, Nagler drops his glasses here and Armstrong, eight light years away, goes, ooh, <laughs> what <laughs> gently, quietly, please. So Einstein got together with a couple of his friends and you have the story in your reader, but I enjoy telling it anyway. Uh, he, and they, they came up with a way to disprove the non-local character of the universe. And the two, two friends were Podelsky and Rosane. I always like to say this is Jewish physics carried to its ultimate conclusion. Einstein, Podelsky, and Rosane. And they said, imagine you were able to fire photons or the light beams. A photon is a packet of life, ener li life energy. Well, okay. <laughs> It's a packet of light energy. When enough photons hit your retina, you say, I am seeing something. So, but a photon is a quantum of light energy. If you fire them in two different directions in such a way that when they reach a target, they will make a choice, as it were. They will be up or down. And they don't know that until they hit the target. There would be no relationship between whether a westbound photon <laughs> – what a westbound photon does and an eastbound photon does. They cannot be in contact because – because why? They're traveling at the speed of light. You are not allowed to go faster than that. So by the time the westbound photon hits Oakland, it cannot send a message to the eastbound photon in time to tell it which way it went. Therefore. You perform this experiment, Einstein, Podelsky, and Rosane said, and you will be able to prove that these two protons are not connected. And therefore, you'll be able to prove that quantum theory is essentially flawed and therefore the universe will have only one bad joke in the 20th century. And they felt very good about that. They probably – I imagine them having a glass of schnapps and Einstein playing his violin. And they all go home and they think, okay, that takes care of quantum theory. Um, but then along came these two guys at Berkeley. Wouldn't you know it? Berkeley, the big troublemaking place. And they figured out – their names were Clauser and Friedman. They figured out a way to do it. 
you fire a certain kind of light made by a calcite beam. This is on page 75 of your reader, but I'm going to simplify it a little bit. When these photons hit their targets, they would go in one direction or another. And according to quantum theory, they are still interconnected. They're exhibiting what's called quantum inseparability. And that means that the, the up photons would be correlated with up photons on the other side, 75 to 25. Whereas if Newton was right and if the world was, was built on a classical model, it would be a local universe. There'd be no connection between these things and it would be 50-50, right? If I toss a coin here in Wheeler, I catch it, it goes heads. You're standing, I don't know, in Milano's. You're standing on line board waiting for your latte and you toss a coin, it's going to be heads 50% of the time, tails 50% of the time. That's because these are coins are huge. They're huge macroscopic objects and they don't follow the laws of quantum reality. But photons are very small and they have to obey those laws. So they actually perform the experiment. There should be a plaque somewhere around campus. I'm sure the, ne the chancellor's next trivia quiz will show you a little plaque where these photons hit the wall. And guess what? Uh, the correlation was like 74.693. In other words, well within the range of experimental error, it showed that those photons were quantumly non-separate and therefore the universe is non-local. Everything that happens, happens everywhere at once. Okay? So I hope you don't have any <laughs> questions about all of this because it's not entirely certain that I'd be able to answer them. But do you have so far? If, you have, if your question is what, why, what it, uh, impelled me to talk about it, I'm getting to that. Yeah? Um, I just wanted to know <laughs> – When I said the life sciences were a soft science, it's because it's difficult to be mathematical about them. Um, and most of the most important features of life cannot be accounted for by physical laws. Uh, what about altruism? Why do animals exhibit altruistic behavior? Why, what's, what's affection all about? You can see the role that it would play in evolution. But you can't see how it comes about mathematically. And the most mathematical part of the life sciences is probably genetics. And okay, well, let's stop and consider that for a minute. Here's, here's Gregor Mendel out in his little pea garden somewhere in Belgium. And he's building this nice mathematical model showing you that genes intercombine and that these determine absolutely whether an ear of corn will be brown or yellow, things like that, you know. And consequently, you know, whether you'll be blonde if you have recessive genes. That the, the whole theory of evolution was put on a mathematical basis by Mendelian principles. But then along comes this lady named Barbara McClintock. Uh, how many of you have heard of her? Well, I would like to, like to get that number up for the next few years. And she goes out into her corn patch and she does now – if she were Indian, what she would say is, I am performing some yama on the corn. Intense concentration. She just lived. She said, what would it be like to be an ear of corn? And she began to suspect that something was going on whereby the organism was actually controlling the genes, not the genes controlling the organism. Needless to say, everybody told her that she was crazy. But in her case, she lived long enough for them to figure out that she was not crazy. She was part of a new paradigm. And if I'm not mistaken, she actually got the Nobel Prize for this. So the one attempt to put animal um, morphology on a, a mathematical basis in fact failed. And we see that it is not a complete description of how genes are going to be dis expressed in an organism. Something extremely soft is going on in the sense that 
the organism, we even run out of language here. How are we going to put this? The ear of corn wants to be yellow <laughs> and it says, uh, send me up about eight yellow genes, will you? And it turns into a yellow ear of corn. Of course, I'm yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Biochemistry and the new uh, molecular sciences of biology. What they're doing is they're studying the molecular aspect of the life sciences. But our point is that that is the aspect of them which has the least to do with what they are. Whereas in a physics lab, that's a complete description. You fire a couple of, I don't know, beams of high energy protons at one another and they go through a cloud chamber. I'm sure it's much more sophisticated now, but in my day it was a cloud chamber. Now it's the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And billions of electron volts that use these things. And we th the way we think of those atoms is that this is a complete description of what they are. Now you can study that aspect of living bodies, but what are you saying about life? Less and less and less. It's like you know more and more and more about less and less. Okay? So that's why people say these are softer sciences. Now this is a prejudice. And like look at uh, my late lamented friend Norman Cousins, for example. Norman Cousins is the editor of the Saturday Review of Literature and he was a big peace person. I mean he was passionately in favor of peace. And uh, at one point in his career, he got a terrible illness and doctors weren't helping him that much and he decided to fix it on his own. And he went in, he got himself a hotel room and showed uh, Charlie Chaplin movies all day long and laughed, laughed himself well. <laughs> he laughed himself sick but in fact he did the exact opposite. He laughed himself well. And he got so interested in what had happened to him that he decided to go into health sciences the rest of his life. Ended up at UCLA. And he said, you know, it's an interesting thing about the soft side of medicine. Things like faith and the will to live and things like that. The soft side has been the same for 5,000 years. And the hard side changes every time somebody at Berkeley goes into his lab and comes up with a new experiment. So this is a prejudice. We think it's harder because it deals with matter evacuated of consciousness and life. And we think we can say things about it mathematically which will be complete. Yeah. But you mean the reductionist aspect of it has been flawed because it can't consider the whole system? Right. Th I wouldn't even say it's flawed. The reductionist approach is superb for what it does. But what it does is very, very little. And the more important the stuff is, that you need to decide, the less the reductionism is going to do it for you. And the tragedy is that because the reductionist aspect is so solid and secure, people have tried to explain life sciences and life on the basis of these reductionist processes. That was the point that I was going to be getting to right now. Uh, and the results of that have been kind of disastrous. I, I have a quote here from – I thought I had a quote here from, yeah, from Robert Oppenheimer. <coughs> if you are a scientist, you believe that it is good to find out how the world works. Okay? So far, I have no quarrels with this. You want to find out how the world works? Hey, you know, I'm all in favor of that. You want to find out how the world works, that it is good to turn over to mankind at large the greatest possible power to control the world. That's, that's where you get to from taking a completely reductionist approach to life. If you give mankind at large, which means ending up – it ends up meaning giving a bunch of nuclear scientists the greatest power to control the world. Uh, what you're going to get is what we've been getting for the last 20 or 30 years. So let me share one other model with you really quickly because I have had so much fun telling you about this part that we're way behind where I had hoped to be at this point. Um, if we take 
one thing on which the classical model and the quantum theoretical model, or let's call it new science, can agree, it's that the universe consists of three big domains or three different kinds of phenomenon. And I'll just put them up here <coughs> in alphabetical order. And they are consciousness, energy, and matter. Okay. Uh, matter being the part that's easiest to deal with and as it turns out has less and less to do with anything <laughs> important and <laughs> interesting. And the classical view of the world is that matter is the ultimate reality as according to that quote from Newton. And then you go from matter to energy somehow. And somehow when there's enough matter and energy, it starts to behave as if it had consciousness. Right? That's when you say the chimpanzees are exhibiting affectionate <laughs> behavior. But we know they're not really having affections. They're just chimpanzee molecules bouncing around in an affection-like way. So I'm purposely making fun of this and it is unfair. But, uh, you know, what can I say? I'm, I'm an angry young man. <laughs> At least I'm angry. Uh, this, this, it really does not work very well. You cannot explain anything very satisfactory based on this classical model that the ultimate reality is matter. And somehow it creates an appearance of energy and somehow that creates an appearance of consciousness. And so what happens is the sciences of consciousness like psychology, not to mention religion, things like that, they split off and they become divorced from science. And then you have poor Mr. Galileo standing in the dock and they are accusing him of saying that the earth moves. The Bible didn't say that and we know perfectly well it doesn't move. And they force him to recant and he says, okay, okay, allora, it doesn't move. All right? You satisfied? And then he turns to get off the dock and someone hears him mumbling, e pur se muove. But it moves, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so you have this complete divorce. Now what basically we're aiming at now is to start from consciousness as the ultimate reality and to see if we can account for energy and matter. This also is not easy, but at least it's more possible in the way that you account for matter in a CEM universe, which is uh, where my head is, <laughs> as opposed to an MEC universe, is that matter is basically a question of appearance. Energy is perceived in a way that gives us the impression of matter. And you'll find that you are now in sync with modern science, I mean real modern science. And you're also in touch with the wisdom tradition that has been the greatest human inheritance going back over thousands of years where the, the wisest people have always been saying something like this in their respective languages. <coughs> now, very quickly, just to show you that all of this is relevant, in fact, and I'm going to get back, I'm going to elaborate on this on Thursday. In this kind of novel that goes from matter to consciousness, there are two extremely unfortunate results with regard to human life. And one is determinism, which we've been talking about. Okay. If you think that everything that you're experiencing is determined by where bits of matter are in your body, that leads eventually to a, a deep sense of despair and helplessness and lack of responsibility and we're finally getting relevant. Thank you for bearing with me for this, during this whole long wrap. But most of you are probably aware that one of the biggest topics in violence and how violence is inflicted and made to happen, people is by getting them to not have a sense of responsibility. And this is where the Milgram experiments that you've probably heard about at Yale, where it shows the extent to which people are dependent on authority. The more you're dependent on authority and the word, the ideas of others, the more violence there is going to be. And that, that's only one of the routes by which you get from determinism to violence. And the other really sad fact of this kind of universe is scarcity. 
And you say, yeah, there's, there's a lot of matter in the universe. I once saw a number somewhere, and the number of molecules in the universe, <coughs> 1 times 10 to the 56 or something like that. It was a huge number of molecules. But the number of molecules that you can use in a, in a life-sustaining system is extremely limited. There was a hundred – took a hundred million years to put enough petroleum in the earth that we have run through in a little under a hundred years. So if, if, I know you, if you think the universe is all material, that leads to a paradigm of scarcity. Now quoting from a social theorist named Ivan Illich who lectured here uh, about 15 years ago. You go from scarcity to competition. You go from competition to violence. Those steps are absolutely inevitable. So once you have – kind of pitched your worldview and what you think the world is on a material basis a la Newton and all the rest of them up until Einstein and Planck, it's going to be nearly impossible to avoid violence, strangely enough. Okay? So if this doesn't seem absolutely absurd to you, let's unpack it a little bit more on Thursday. <laughs>